Uh, hello, I'm Tony Rains. I'm really sorry that I'm not present physically at this screening of A Time to Live, A Time to Die. But on this very day that you're watching this, that's the 12th of October, I think, uh, I have to be in Busan, in Korea, uh, taking part in an event to announce the publication of a book that I've written about my uh, connections over the years with Korean films and filmmakers. Um, and I won't be back until too late to take part in, in a live event at the Garden Cinema. Time to Live and a Time to Die is Ho's, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, sixth film, sixth feature. The first three were commercial vehicles for pop stars. The third and a half film was Sandwich Man, his episode for that film, which played recently in this series. And after that, he, like many filmmakers, did his best to get away from CMPC, Central Motion Picture Corporation, uh, which was the government-run film studio, the largest film enterprise in Taiwan at the time, uh, and started making low-budget independent films. The first two were Boys from Feng Gui, which was kind of not directly autobiographical, but certainly inspired by his own adolescent experiences. And the second was A Summer at Grandpa's, uh, Dong Dong de Jia Qi, which uh, was inspired pretty directly by his screenwriter Zhu Tian Wen's uh, childhood experiences. He moved from those films into A Time to Live, Time to Die, because neither Boys from Feng Gui nor Summer at Grandpa's was a big hit in Taiwan, they were very short of money, and he had no choice but to go back to CMPC to make this film, which was a relatively large-scale undertaking. It's, it's not a big epic spectacle of the kind that he sometimes made a bit later, but uh, it is um, a film rooted in the past, and it needed some careful casting, some careful set dressing, some careful location finding and so on to make it possible to recreate the 1950s and 1960s in Taipei. The film, as you will see in a moment, opens with a voiceover saying something like, uh, these are memories from my own childhood, in particular about my father. And they appear over shots of an empty house. The voice you hear is director Ho Xiaoxian's own voice, and it announces at the beginning of the film that this is going to be something very personal for him. Uh, it's doubly personal because the house that you're looking at on the screen is the actual house that he grew up in. So I think one of his brothers was actually living in the house at that time and was paid to go and move to a hotel for a while while they shot in the house. It was shot in May to July uh, 1984. Spent quite a lot of time in post-production after that. Um, and during that period, I was lucky enough to visit the shoot. I went together with my friend Edward Yang and some other people, including the theatre director Stan Lai, Lai Sheng Chuan, um, who was a big fan of the new cinema at the time, the emerging new cinema of the time. And we spent a couple of days down in Fengshan and Kaohsiung nearby, uh, hanging out and watching the shooting take place. Um, I, I took some photos during that visit, the first one, which you're probably seeing as we speak, um, shows Ho Xiaoxian at the left in white, uh, talking to two of his guests, Edward Yang in the middle with wearing dark glasses, and uh, Stan Lai next to him on the right. I took the photo, so it's, it's, I'm not there. It was a very interesting experience. It was my first time to meet Ho Xiaoxian, although I had already by this time seen his acting performance in, I well, he makes a cameo appearance in The Boys from Feng Gui, but he plays a substantial leading role in Edward Yang's feature, Taipei Story, uh, which I thought was the greatest of the early Taiwan New Wave films, and uh, I was particularly impressed by his performance in it. Anyhow, we, we hit it off very well, uh, we became friends, we saw each other quite a lot over the following years, and from the early 90s, or actually the mid-90s onwards, uh, with a film called Good Men, Good Women, he asked me to do the English subtitles for his films, which I did right up until the end, the, the last film, The Assassin. Sadly, his health is now in decline, and I don't think he will make any more films, but uh, I think he, you know his reputation is assured in film history because of uh, the extraordinary qualities of the work that he did and how innovative and 
forward-looking it always was. This film um, came from something that, that I talked about briefly when I introduced Sandwich Man and In Our Time earlier in this series. I said that one of the priorities of the new cinema directors was to present a truthful account as opposed to the official version of what it was like to grow up in Taiwan uh, in the years after the civil war in China. The civil war, as you know, was won by the communists in 1949. There had already been uh, an influx of mainlanders to Taiwan before that, including the family that the film is about. Because Taiwan had been a Japanese colony up until 1945, the defeat of Japan led to the exodus of the Japanese in Taiwan, but they left traces. Um, so Ho Xiaoxian's family was one of the families that arrived before the communist victory in the mainland. The communist victory in 1949 was followed by a massive influx of government people, civil servants, uh, politicians, and so on and so on. And Taiwan became the Republic of China. Well, um, I said traces of Japan were left, and one of them is, of course, this very house, which you will see immediately is totally Japanese style. And as Ho Xiaoxian's film, later film, uh, City of Sadness, begins with the Japanese retreat from Taiwan in 1945 and some very sad farewells between uh, departing Japanese and their Chinese friends in Taiwan, the Japanese were not thought of as oppressive colonizers on the whole. However, those who arrived in the late 40s, uh, like the family in the film, uh, have ambivalent feelings about the mainland that they came from. Ho's particular family is a Hakka family, or Kerja in Mandarin. The, the, these are southern people, they're mostly water-based people. They, they lived on boats, mostly. Uh, and they have their own cuisine, they have their own culture, and their own dialect, which you hear a little bit in the film, spoken by the grandmother character. But the film does broach uh, what it's like to be a mainlander in Taiwan in the 1950s and through 1966. The film ends around 1966, the story. The film reflects the fact that Taiwan is militarized. Young men are expected to do military service. Uh, there is quite a lot of military presence in the peripheries of the film. You know, tanks rumble through the, the streets of Fengshan at one point, and uh, you know, the kids all look at these bizarre uh, tank tread marks in the on the road uh, afterwards the next day. Direct contact with the mainland is is not possible at this point. Uh, so mail from the mainland has to come via a third country. In the case of the film, it's South Africa because they have an uh, the family has an aunt based in South Africa. She receives mail from China and she passes on the news from China, which is something that occurs during the film. All of this is scrupulously accurate. This is exactly what happened. And if, if you were a stamp collector uh, in childhood, then you will probably recognize some of those lion and zebra stamps that South Africa used to send, which the kids get so excited about because they were you know, foundations of many stamp collections at the time. I, I think the film is, is very substantially self-explanatory. Uh, the style is one that Ho Xiaoxian has been evolving uh, over the course of the two previous features, Boys from Feng Gui and Summer at Grandpa's. Uh, it is quite objective. Most of it is in mid-shot or even long shot. There are very few close-ups. Um, there is a strong insistence on the social context in which everything happens in the course of this film. And there is very little camera movement. When there is camera movement, it's for a very distinct purpose, which you can immediately discern. It's a very compelling watch, and many people, I think, will find it, as I did when I first saw it, quite emotional. It's a, it's a film that touches on very deep feelings, actually. But it is fundamentally Ho Xiaoxian's account of his own coming of age. The central character, who is a boy for the first hour of the film, a quite young boy, known as Aha rather than A Xiao, because uh, that's his name in his grandma's Hakka dialect. Um, but in the second half of the film, he's uh, A Xiao, because his, his name is Ho Xiaoxian. Uh, and he becomes the de facto head of the family but when his mother is, is has to be moved up to Taipei in the north of the island for medical treatment. 
um, and this is a very maturing experience for him. Anyhow, the film chronicles what it's like to grow up in quite a large family. It's, it chronicles what it's like to be drawn into gang life, gang fights and such like, which was, I think, very autobiographically true of Ho Xiao Xian. Uh, what it's like to suddenly get a sense of maturity, what it's like to lose your virginity to a prostitute in his case, um, what it's like to have your first girlfriend, your first wet dream. All of these things are in the film, and so it's very candid in, in its autobiography. But at the same time, it has a larger perspective because he's using his story, that of an immigrant family arriving in Taiwan, moving down to the south for the sake of the father's health, uh, because it's less humid down in the south than it is up in the north. Um, he uses this experience as some kind of talisman, you could say, for a larger experience of mainlanders in Taiwan. Uh, this is also the focus of someone like Edward Yang in a film like A Brighter Summer Day, where you will find conflicts between native Taiwanese gangs, um, military associated gangs, the sons of uh, military serving officers and, and uh, privates in the, in the Republic of China Army, and others like Edward Yang, who were the sons of scientists, workers, educationalists, civilians in other words, but also mainlanders. So those conflicts are explored in A Brighter Summer Day in a different way they're explored in this film too, um, and through the prism of, as the title gives us to understand, life and death. As you'll see, it's it's an almost plotless film. There, the, nothing happened. Ho Xiao Shen by this time has given up on melodrama. There is no hint of melodrama in the film, um, and he uses occasional voiceovers spoken by himself to remind us constantly that this is a very personal account. However, the achievement of the film, what makes it a great film, I think, is the way that it maintains both a personal perspective and a larger, more objective perspective about what it was like for many families, many people in the rapidly changing Taiwan of the 1950s and 60s. Anyway, thanks for watching and have a wonderful time with A Time to Live, A Time to Die.